And the new scores will also incorporate non-traditional items, rent, utilities, telecommunications. And we have a lot of consumers today that don't have traditional credit, like a credit card or a mortgage loan, but they might be paying rent, they pay utilities. How can we incorporate those into these newer generations of credit scores and expand the pool of potential home buyers? Exciting changes coming to mortgage scoring. Today we have Mike Golden and Glenn Leach here to talk to us about it. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Well, my name is Glenn Leach. I am a loan officer with uh, Veterans United Home Loans in Puyallup, Washington. Uh, I've been in the industry going on 22 years and I've kind of made it a uh, primary focus of my business to deal with credit challenged borrowers. It's kind of how I made my name in the industry and um, really, really love helping people, you know, buy their first home or, you know, get ready to do whatever home loan they need that's going to better their lives. And anyway, that's why I'm here talking about this topic today. And my name is Mike Olden. Uh, I've been an American reporting company, which is a uh, provider of of credit reports and mortgages to the uh, to, to the mortgage banking industry, uh, lenders like Glenn. Glenn and I have been colleagues uh, for over 20 years, and I've been here at ARC since 1997 and in the industry since 1984 uh, and throughout that entire time uh, on, the, on the credit reporting and credit scoring side of our industry. So great. So how did you guys meet? So when I started in the industry in 2002, um, the internet was still young, uh, not very sophisticated. Back then we had to click from page to page uh, rather than having this you know, steady stream of information. And every time you clicked on a new page, you'd get a pop-up ad. And those pop-up ads seemed to all be for mortgages. And they advertise for people who had horrible credit to apply. And the company I was working for bought those leads and passed them out to us loan officers. And we're supposed to call these people and turn them into loans. Um, and all of them were horrible because that's what the pop-up ads asked for. And I didn't know how to work with these people. And Mike was our credit representative. And I started asking him questions to see if he knew how I could help these people rather than just throw them in the trash bin. And uh, he started showing me a little bit about credit improvement. And I took that idea and just ran with it and started helping these people fix their credit. Um, I became the preferred lender for two nationwide collection companies. So I was doing loans in all 50 states from these collectors that were sending me their clients and uh, then I started working with first-time home buyers at nonprofit agencies, and I've taught hundreds of credit classes. I even just published a book on how to fix your credit. And I look back on that, all that came from Mike and him originally helping me figure out this topic. So he kind of helped me build my entire career. Well, th th thanks, Glenn. That's a uh, uh, very, very kind uh, testimonial. I appreciate it. And at American Reporting Company, and we're here in the in the Seattle metro area, uh, uh, and and also myself uh, is uh, education is very important, and uh, the concept of informing, educating, and encouraging our clients, colleagues, and the home buyers, uh, the people that Glenn works with. And we feel it's very important to help them understand what's going on on their credit report and what they can do uh, to either maintain it or improve it uh, on there. And, and, and we'll talk about some of those uh, uh, items uh, a, a little bit. We'll touch on those, but uh, uh, I think it's very important for each of us as consumers to be aware of what's showing up on our credit report, why it shows up, 
and the impact it can have on our credit scores. Yeah, so Mike, you work with the actual credit reports, providing support to mortgage companies and to, to loan officers. And Glenn, you know, you take your knowledge of credit scoring to go help your clients to obtain loans. So it's been over 20 years since the scoring model has changed. So what is driving these changes? Well, I, I, I think there's a lot of things that are driving this, but um, about a year ago, uh, uh, FHFA, uh, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is the con conservator for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the two largest purchasers of mortgage loans. And for several years, they have been looking to modernize credit score models. Uh, for the past 25 years, our industry has exclusively used FICO scores. And I think most consumers are familiar with FICO scores, previously known as the Fair Isaac Company, but now FICO. And But we're still using older generations of FICO scores, versions 2, 4, and 5. We're all the way up to FICO version 10T, and we'll go into detail on in that in a moment. But that was a major driver of these changes. How can we modernize the scores so they're more comprehensive, they uh, perform better on risk assessment, and they broaden the number of consumers uh, that can generate a credit score? Also connected to that is the use of Vantage scores. And Vantage is a competitor to FICO. It's owned by the three major credit bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Collectively, they own Vantage score solutions. And both scores, FICO and Vantage, have a lot of similarities, but they are different. Uh, and so, FHFA, in this initiative, they want to create more competition. Uh, they, they feel that these newer versions of credit scores will provide more precise assessment of credit risk. Uh, and the new scores will also incorporate uh, non-traditional items. Uh, historically, that's been rent, utilities, telecommunications, and we have a lot of consumers today that don't have traditional credit, like a credit card or a mortgage loan, a student loan, but they might be paying rent, they pay utilities, they pay telecom, their cell phones. So how can we incorporate those into these newer generations of credit scores and expand the pool of potential home buyers? Okay, so buy merge average score, try merge mid score. We've heard about only pulling two of these. Uh, so instead of three, so help us understand that. Yeah, G G Glenn, why don't you take that as the lender? Because that's going to impact you uh, more than anyone. Right. So um, the idea behind the buy merge idea is that uh, it's going to reduce cost to the consumer. Because as a lender, we have to pay for all the credit reports that we use. And if we only have to use two, then that should save us money that we can pass on to the consumer. So that's kind of the driving force behind it. Um, what we're finding out as we dig into this a little deeper, and one of the reasons for the delay of this being rolled out is that lenders are concerned about, well, which two of the bureaus are we supposed to use? And if we pick the wrong two, is that going to harm a consumer? If we pick two and another lender picks a different two, um, you know, now we've got two different scores that we're competing with. And it's it seems like it may create some, um, some harm uh, to the consumer uh, unless we flesh this out how exactly it's going to work. Um, so is it going to come down to a lender has to pull all three and then pick the best two? Well, now we've got more costs involved in the loan. And now we've also got a pull from FICO and Bandage Score. So now we've got costs there. Um, it, 
we're going to see how this this lands in the end. But right now, it's just kind of confusing to us on this end. Uh, we're supposed to, according to the last Vantage uh, webinar I watched, in quarter three of 2024, we're supposed to start supplying consumers with copies of Vantage Score 4.0 and FICO 10T, but we're still going to have to use the FICO 2, 4, and 5 for qualifying, which might be lower scores than what we're showing the consumer. And so, yeah, lenders are just asking questions right now about, you know, you guys need to make this a little more clear to us because we're pretty confused on our end. Yeah. And, and Jeff, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've had uh, several conversations with colleagues uh, back in on Capitol Hill in, in Washington uh, associated with our industry. And this is a multi-year process and it's supposed to begin in earnest next month, January, 2024. Uh, but in my conversations, I think this is going to get pushed down the line a bit. And, and Glenn brought up a good point, a scenario, would a lender be able to pull three bureaus and choose the best two? That won't be allowed. Uh, and, and we'll share a link to uh, a great uh, FAQ resource from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that goes into detail there. They could elect to choose which two of the three bureaus they pull from but they couldn't pick and choose uh, you know, the two best scores if they pulled three, then you're, you're looking at some potential fair lending issues that could impact a consumer in a negative manner. Okay, so how would new credit scores impact the mortgage industry? Well, right now, as, as Glenn mentioned, we're using older generations, 20-year-old generations of FICO scores, FICO version 2, 4, and 5. And the newer version that's being proposed, FICO 10T, uh, is in existence. And in between that, we have versions 8 and 9. Uh, many credit card lenders or other uh, extenders of credit are using versions 8 and 9. Uh, the T in FICO 10T stands for trended data. And the trended data is being used as an underwriting tool today by, uh, by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, but it's not impacting the credit scores that we're using in the mortgage industry. That will change when we adopt these new credit score versions. And that trended data looks back 24 months and it says, hey, is Mike paying his, his balances, especially credit card balances, in full each month? Or is he just making the minimum payment each month? And that will uh, serve as a tool to help assess risk. So credit cards are unsecured debt. That's a higher risk than a mortgage, a car loan, even a government-backed student loan. There's recourse for the lender if I don't make those payments. On a credit card, the only thing backing that up is my signature, my promise to repay. So if you have two consumers, if, if Glenn makes all of his credit card payments in full each month, the full balance, and I only make the minimum payment each month, Glenn's probably going to score higher because he's projecting a much lower risk than I am by carrying those balances from month to month. So that's that's an important aspect of moving to the new credit score models. The other one is, again, the, the ability to bring in what we call non-traditional credit, items like rent, utilities, telecom, insurance, and help that consumer who maybe has very limited or no traditional credit, still generate credit scores and become a successful home buyer. Um, so based on the Vantage score research, so Vantage score, um, it's taken 17 years for the bureaus to develop their scoring system. 
they have tested their scoring system with 45 million actual consumer files to see how they will perform under their various uh, gyrations of how they've come up with their scoring model. They determined that there's going to be about 33 million more consumers who have credit scores using their system versus the current FICO systems. And of those, about 12 million of them will have scores high enough to buy a house right away. Um, so it's it's interesting, you know, how well tested it is and what the results are is we're probably going to see more consumers eligible to move forward with their home loans. Good news. Good news. So another term I've heard out there is Experian Boost. Can you help us understand that? Sure. Experian Boost has been around uh, a few years now, and that's a partnership between Experian, one of the three major credit bureaus, and FICO. And what a consumer would do is they would give permission to Experian to go out and pull payment history from uh, utilities, telecom, rent, and report that to Experian. Uh, and it will imp help improve scores on FICO version 8. But the current versions we're using in the mortgage industry, those older versions, 2, 4, and 5, it does not impact those scores. So it, 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 gives, it gives a consumer a jump start uh, if their scores, maybe they're in the lower to mid 600s, but you add these non-traditional accounts in the Experian Boost program, it can increase the FICO score uh, if they have good payment history. And one question that I've received a number of times is, uh, will, will the bureaus in general, and specifically to, to the Experian Boost, only report positive information? Uh, that's not the case. When a creditor reports to the bureaus, they can't pick and choose information. They have to report all account information, good or bad. Uh, so if a consumer uh, wasn't managing their accounts well, uh, there's a good chance there's gonna have a negative impact on the scores and they'll be lower than they probably want them to be. Um, so, but I think Experian Boost is a great program, especially for uh, younger borrowers, recently immigrated borrowers who don't have a lot of traditional credit as we know it in the United States. And uh, hopefully with the, with the newer version of credit scores coming down the line, uh, we'll, we'll see that applied to mortgage applicants as well. So let me jump on top of that, too, because um, with Experian Boost, the consumer has the ability to pick and choose which accounts they want to be reported. So if they have bad rent history, they probably wouldn't pick that one. But if their streaming service payments are on time, they will go, they would want those reported. So. What I'm wondering is when we go to Vantage 4.0, FICO 10T, is if the consumer is still going to have the ability to pick and choose which alternative trade lines get reported. And, you know, are they going to have a chance to go in and delete some that didn't turn out the way they expected, like they can with Experian Boost? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we haven't heard that in our conversations with the bureaus and 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 at ARC, we speak with the bureaus on a on on a regular basis, if not monthly, uh, on there, and we haven't really heard anything on that. If you uh, the the some of the collateral material we're going to share with the viewers today um, in, in there. They'll they'll reference those non-traditional items, and they will report when available and when they're reporting. So oftentimes, uh, historically, it's up to the creditor if they report. Credit reporting is elective; it's not required. <clears throat> but we haven't really seen any any clarity around uh, the concept of 
consumer permission access to their accounts in those newer versions. So to, to Glenn's point of, of the question there, we don't have a clear answer yet on that. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, be careful what you ask for, uh, because if you, uh, if you give permission and you don't have a good payment history, uh, that could do some damage, uh, certainly in the short term. Okay. Another topic. Can you explain uh, recent changes in medical collections? Yes. Uh, that is, um, uh, something that has been, uh, developing over the last 18 months that began in July of 2022, where any medical collection uh, under $500 that was paid was subsequently deleted from a consumer's credit file. So uh, that was terrific. And, and on the credit reports that we provide to our clients, uh, medical collections as small as 20 or $25, we've seen scores drop 50, 80, 100 points. Uh, it's not the dollar amount. It's how recently did that collection begin reporting to the credit bureaus? Because that's immediate risk and a credit score measures risk into the future. Uh, so that was subsequently updated this year any medical collection under $500 paid or unpaid is no longer eligible to be reported on any of the three credit bureaus. So a good break for consumers. And I was shocked by this number. 41% of credit files had a medical collection present on those reports. Uh, I figured it'd be about 10, 15%, but 41%. So that's a lot. The second part of this was any medical collection over $500, or I should say any medical bill over $500 that was sent to a collection agency, there's a 12 month moratorium, a cooling off period, if you will. It cannot re be reported in the first 12 months because if any of the viewers or, or, or Jeff, you or Glenn are like me, you've had a medical bill. Uh, there's some correspondence problems between the provider, the insurer, the patient. It gets reported as a collection. It's not accurate. And that's, that's what precipitated all of this. Uh, several state attorneys general in the United States reached an agreement with the Bureau saying, too much dirty data out there. Uh, we want you to do this. It's not a law, but it was uh, sort of a hammer over their head, reach an agreement with us, uh, or we may have to take the next step. So they did reach this agreement. Uh, so that's a really good break for a lot of consumers. FICO and Vantage had already moved in that direction before this agreement because in their testing, and as Glenn mentioned, both of them test millions of files each year. They did not see anything indicative correlating between a medical collection and the ability to repay a mortgage loan. So they had already made that adjustment in these newer versions, but now the bureaus uh, have followed suit, and uh, they have those uh, those new updates on medical collections. Good. Well, that's a ton of information that you guys have provided with us. As we wrap up here, any final parting thoughts or a takeaway you hope someone, uh, a listener, hears and, and, and learns and applies from this? Don't ever be discouraged by what's showing up on your credit report. Even negative data has a life expectancy at most seven years, bankruptcies 10 years. And the further away we get from that negative occurrence, potentially the less impact is on our credit scores and in the eyes of an underwriter. So the first 24 months, that's critical. Uh, you don't wanna see negative items that have occurred that recently. But as we move past it, the impact is less, but again, don't ever be discouraged. We can work past that 
we can bring ourselves back to a good point. Uh, and Glenn's the lending expert. Um, you know, he can he can talk uh, about uh, how low we can go uh, on scores uh, or underwriting requirements. So, Glenn, what what what's your thought? Well, first of all, one of the interesting things about this whole topic is that this only applies to conventional loans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. It so far doesn't apply to government loans, which are VA, FHA, and USDA. Um, and, you know, we're the largest VA lender in the country. So we deal mostly with VA clients and none of these credit score changes even apply to our VA clients um, at this point, but there's still a long way to go. So we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what's allowed, um, for example, a VA loan does not require any credit score per the VA. So the VA will guarantee a loan if they don't even have a credit score, uh, but most lenders won't approve that loan. So lenders get to put their own rules on it. And typically, I mean, I've seen some lenders at 580 scores. Um, we happen to be at 600 scores. Uh, 620 is a very common score uh, that lenders will allow. But as far as getting it approved, if, if a lender says, we don't care if you have a score or not, the VA would allow that loan to close. So that's kind of interesting. FHA is kind of the same way. Um, so, I mean, we'll, so we'll see what this next year brings. I don't expect any of this to be official until 2025 or beyond. Uh, so we got a long way to go. There's still a lot of commenting and discussion going on between uh, FHFA and, and all the lenders out there that are concerned because, you know, we don't want to hurt borrowers. And if any of these changes come in, it looks like it's going to hurt a segment of the population. We don't want that. Um, so, you know, we're going to make sure the rule is right before it gets rolled out. Well, good. Well, I think I think this may be the first part of a continuing discussion that we we have going forward as we get deeper into this and changes come about and just see even getting deeper into trended data and all this, you know, going forward. So um, I will make sure we get the contact information for each of you put onto the video and the, the uh, other information that you guys have referenced. So viewers and listeners can find a way to uh, to access it. I want to thank each of you guys for, for coming on today, and I hope you guys will come back on in the future. Well, thank you, Jeff. Would be Always delighted. a pleasure, Jeff.